defeat at Trabia struck fear into the Roman leadership. The Republic lost all control over Cisalpine Gaul. Hannibal succeeded in bringing Gauls to his side, nearly doubling his army. 40,000 infantry and 10,000 cavalry are now under his command. But before Hannibal resumes his attack on Rome, I want to give a shout out for Curiosity Stream. They've recently become one of my favorite streaming services, a place that allows me to access thousands of high quality documentaries for just $3 per month. I highly recommend you check them out and sign up using the link in the description and the code HISTORYMARSH to get a 30-day unlimited free access to their entire library. Whether you like documentaries about physics, space, biology, genetics, medicine, evolution, engineering, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, and much more, CuriosityStream literally has you covered. History is my personal favorite, and I just binge watched the new Real War of Thrones season two. I won't give any spoilers, but you can go check it out yourself. Click on the link in the description below and use the code HISTORYMARSH to sign up for a 30-day unlimited free access to the entire documentary library on CuriosityStream. Faced with the Gallic uprising in Cisalpine Gaul, and still shocked by the loss of tens of thousands of troops at Trebia, the Roman Senate is determined to turn things around in 217 BC. Amidst the political turmoil, two new consuls are elected and sent north against Hannibal with newly raised armies. Other theatres of war are not ignored, evident by the victory against the Carthaginians at the Ebro and the planned reinforcements set for Iberia later in the year. But the main focus of the Roman war effort is on home soil. The plan is to use the geography of the Italian peninsula to their advantage. With the vast marshlands of the Arno River in the west thought to be impassable during winter and spring, and the rugged Apennine mountain range cutting across the peninsula. The Romans know that there are only two routes into central Italy that Hannibal can take, and they move to block both. Consul Gaius Flaminius positions his army at Aretium, including the 10,000 legionaries that survived the Battle of Trebia. His co-consul, Gnaeus Servilius Geminus, is stationed at Ariminium. Both armies are bolstered with a higher number of horsemen than usual, perhaps to offset their numerical inferiority in cavalry. Hannibal, meanwhile, has problems of his own. While he did establish a base of operations in the Po Valley, Gallic support will weaken over time as his army continues to consume their resources. At the same time, the Romans decided not to pursue further battles in the north, so staying there makes little sense for Hannibal. He needs to put pressure on the Romans before his Gallic allies lose interest in the war. Just like the Senate, Hannibal knows that he can either go down the Adriatic coast and fight Servilius in the rugged terrain of Picinum, or he can fight Flaminius in the difficult Apennine mountain passes. Neither route is good. Whichever he chose, not only would the Romans be alerted about his movement ahead of time, but he would be forced into a prolonged an uncertain battle against the well-defended Roman positions, which would allow time for the two consular armies to link up, something that Hannibal can ill afford. But with the arrival of warm spring weather, the Carthaginian general does the unexpected. He decides to force march his army across the Apennine Mountains and through the dangerous marshlands of the Arno River, aiming to surprise the two consuls and get into a good position to threaten Rome itself. The plan is arguably just as audacious as was the crossing of the Alps. The march is extremely difficult. Hannibal places his most disciplined infantry, the hard-marching Libyans and Iberians, at the head of the column. They set a fast pace, which the Gauls find difficult to maintain, as they are not used to forced marches. And by being at the back of the column, they face the added difficulty of having to march through the sticky quagmire that has been churned up by the troops in front of them. The cavalry is in the rear of the column, ushering the Gauls forward and keeping an eye on any who might decide to turn back. 
The terrain, however, is the army's biggest enemy. The Arno River flooded after winter rains, turning the river basin into heavily flooded, muddy wetlands. The endless, dense swampland offers almost no dry areas for resting. Hannibal's troops wade through deep pools of water for four days and three nights, with almost no sleep and no rest, whilst carrying their heavy equipment and supplies. Those fortunate enough to be mounted are able to sleep in their saddles, while a handful of those on foot manage to climb onto the bodies of dead horses and pack animals for a brief rest. Many die due to infection, disease, exhaustion and drowning. Hannibal himself catches an eye infection which cannot be treated because there is no time during the forced march and he carries the infection for much of the journey, eventually losing sight in one eye. He emerges from the swamp on the back of his sole surviving elephant, probably the brave Syrian. All the while, the Romans assumed that Hannibal is contained in the north. But what they didn't know is that the Carthaginian general managed to cross the Apennine Mountains and the Arno River wetlands with 50,000 troops in just four days, without being detected, and is now in position for the next stage of his campaign. He grants his army a few days to rest and sends scouting parties south. He learns that Flaminius is at Aretium and that the Etrurian plain can offer enough food and plunder to boost the morale of the troops. Having learned that Flaminius is an arrogant and rash commander, he plans to provoke him into giving battle by pillaging and burning the rich Etrurian countryside. Soon enough, Plumes of smoke from burning villages and fields dot the lands west of Aretium, followed by the Carthaginian column passing right next to Flaminius, brazenly taunting the Roman general. Watching from Aretium, Flaminius is fuming, knowing that it is he who is supposed to protect these lands, and yet one of the richest areas in Italy is burning on his watch. But he somehow resists challenging the Carthaginian general, persuaded by his advisers to stay put and wait until Servilius joins him. Unable to force an open battle, for Hannibal, an assault on Aretium is out of the question. He cannot risk losing too many of his experienced soldiers that he cannot replace. His army also has limited supplies and has to keep moving. Furthermore, Hannibal has no way of knowing how far the other Roman army is, and as far as he knows, Servilius could be arriving any day now. So the Carthaginian general decides to press on. Leaving not one, but two armies in his rear must have seemed mad. But actually, by bypassing Aretium, Hannibal maintains the initiative and keeps the Romans guessing. He wants to be the one who dictates the course of the campaign. Scouts soon bring good news. Flaminius decided not to wait for Servilius after all. Knowing that the battle is soon coming, Hannibal makes sure to let his Gallic troops know that they will be fighting against Flaminius, the man who caused them much misery in years past. Flaminius is renowned for his victories against Gallic tribes, he is responsible for introducing a law that allowed Romans to settle near and on Gallic lands. This created conflict, which Flaminius resolved by invading and occupying more Gallic lands, and then proceeded to settle more Romans on the lands he conquered. Needless to say, he is hated by the Gauls, and the 17,000 of them in Hannibal's army can't wait to get their hands on him. Meanwhile, for the Roman army that prides itself on its military prowess, it must be humiliating to pass through villages and countryside laid waste by the enemy. But Flaminius can still redeem himself, and he is only one day's march away. It's early morning on June 24th, 217 BC. Flaminius marches out of his camp towards the smoke rising in the distance, apparently from Carthaginian campfires, eager to get to grips with the enemy. In the front, he places veteran legionaries that survived the Battle of Trebia, who are also very keen on meeting the enemy in battle. 
As the column moves, a low hanging mist envelops the lake and the valley. The shoreline is eerily quiet. The locals seem to have vanished. Unable to see too far ahead, the Romans literally stumble into Hannibal's heavy infantry, who are blocking the road. Fighting spontaneously erupts at the far end of the valley. Despite being surprised by the enemy, the Roman vanguard forms up in battle formation. Further back, it is some time before the Roman center and rear realize what is happening in the front. The visibility is hampered by the low-hanging morning mist. But in the hills above the mist, Hannibal's hidden troops can clearly see the Roman column. Although they do not know it yet, the Romans walked straight into an ambush. But let's take a moment to consider how difficult it was to set up the ambush at Lake Trasimene. Hannibal couldn't just send his troops up the hill to their positions, that would have left tracks all across the hillside. And with Flaminius hot on his heels, he didn't have much time either. Yet, Hannibal marched to the eastern end of the valley and somehow managed to coordinate tens of thousands of troops around the hills to the north into their correct positions at night, all within a brief window of time and without arousing any suspicion. This is without doubt quite an astonishing military feat. Now, Hannibal signals his hidden forces to attack. It's unclear if trumpets signaled the start of the attack, or if his captains were ordered to wait until the Romans were deep enough into the valley. Whatever the case, the ambush succeeds completely. The use of campfires in the distance tricked the Romans into moving deep into the valley, thinking that the Carthaginians are further ahead. And by masterfully hiding tens of thousands of his troops in the hills, Hannibal completely surrounded the enemy. Coming seemingly out of nowhere, Numidian cavalry and Gallic heavy infantry engage the Roman rear, closing off their line of retreat. Hannibal's light infantry, skirmishers and Gallic heavy infantry clash with the Roman center. Having previously marched in a very loose formation, Flaminius' army is caught completely by surprise. They soon find themselves in a fight for their life. The formations break up and many soldiers are left to fend for themselves. The fighting is so fierce that none of the combatants notice a strong nearby earthquake. After less than an hour of fighting, Hannibal's troops split apart the disorganized enemy column. From this point on, the battle becomes a slaughter. Numidians and Gauls overwhelm the Roman rear, forcing them all the way to the lake shore. Many try to swim in their heavy armor, desperate to get away. According to Polybius, many Romans drown in the lake, while others who manage to stay afloat beg for mercy, but are killed there and there. The Roman center fights a brave last stand, but after another two hours of fighting, most of Flaminius's men are cut down, while others drown in the lake as they try to swim away. According to legend, the Roman consul is recognized amidst the fighting, and the enraged Gauls fight to get to him. The consul's best troops rally to protect him. But one of the Gallic warriors fights his way through and thrusts his spear into the consul, killing him. Meanwhile, the Roman vanguard still stands firm. Once they realize that the battle is lost, they start fighting their way through Hannibal's heavy infantry, desperate to escape the field. But they too would be captured within a day or two after the battle. In less than three hours of fighting, a whole Roman army is virtually wiped out. It is said that Flaminius' body was torn to pieces by Gallic soldiers, so much so that Hannibal was not able to find any trace of the consul after the battle to give him a proper burial. Carthaginian losses, meanwhile, are minor. Large plunder is taken, especially military equipment. Hannibal re-equips his infantry. Each man is given Roman mail, a bronze helmet, and an oval scutum shield. Within a few days, the Romans suffer another disastrous loss. As Servilius was on the move to join Flaminius, he hurriedly sent all of his 4,000 cavalry ahead of the army to help his co-consul. 
Hannibal learned of their movement, even before Servilius knew about Flaminius's defeat. Mahabal, Hannibal's second in command, rode out to meet them, launching a surprise attack. Those who survived were captured. By eliminating Servilius's cavalry, Hannibal effectively neutralized his entire consular army. Few, if any, commanders have been able to match Hannibal's ambush at Lake Trasimene, where one entire army ambushed and effectively destroyed another entire army. The population of Rome fell into utter despair, as Lake Trasimene is not far, and it seems like there is nothing that can stop Hannibal from attacking the city, as Servilius had to withdraw back to Ariminium to counter the Gauls who, encouraged by Hannibal's presence, aggressively began raiding Roman territory. In this time of crisis, the Senate appoints a dictator, a certain Fabius Maximus, to coordinate the defense against Hannibal. But more on that in the next episode.